All right, we'll get started as people still trickle in. Um, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, thanks for joining us today. We're very excited about today's discussion. But before we get into that, we have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to get to. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marisol Salcido, and I am the Opus Mind Manager at Opus Connect, filling in for my colleague, Lena, who's not with us today. So who are we? Uh, Opus Connect is a lower middle, middle market m and focused professional organization. We have members in the fields of private equity, banking, finance, and other transactional professions. We have over 250 events a year, ranging from our members only roundtables, fireside chats, deal connect events, our Opus Mind peer-to-peer -peer community of mastermind groups, webinars like today, and our lunch for six. If you're interested in learning more about any of those events or membership, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Swayze Yancey, for more information. Q&A. Today we'll have Q&A. You'll have the opportunity to submit live questions to the panelists. Um, our moderator, Tim, will be monitoring that bubble. Please uh, only use the Q&A option. Do not use the chat feature to submit any questions. And these events would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So I'd like to begin by introducing Sapien Investigations. David, I see you. Take it away. Good morning. Uh, hi, this is David Kogan with Sapien Investigations. It's always great to be at Opus Connect. For those of you who don't know us, we're a uh, international corporate intelligence firm in, th in this ecosystem. We really specialize in uh, executive background checks. We, do, we whether it be uh, you know management teams, large commercial borrowers, uh, joint venture partners, um, really anyone on the in the deal, kind of in the deal world, we, we, we look at, we also have a very robust business dispute and litigation practice. Um, and again, if there's any way we can help any of you guys, we look forward to meeting you later today. Feel free to reach out to me. It's always great to be here. Thanks. Thank you, David. Alliant, Fran, I see you. Let me unmute you. Good morning, Marisol, thank you. Alliant is among the fastest growing insurance brokerages in the industry. As the 10th largest brokerage firm, uh, we place approximately 19 billion in written premiums across 110 offices with 4,300 employees. Um, I'm with the, our M&A practice. We provide pre-close, post-close procurement initiatives and um, transactional products such as rep and warranty insurance to assist our private equity clients. Um, we closed approximately 5,000 collective M&A deals in recent years, um, placing about 70 million in premium. We work with 130 um, plus private equity firms. If there's anything I can do to assist, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Next up, we have King Edward first. Nick, I see you. Please introduce yourself and your firm. Sorry about that, I was muted. Hi, I'm Nick Benedict with King Edward First. We're a full service digital marketing agency. Our services range from bring us in to do an audit of how your marketing team is performing for yourself or a portfolio company, um, to evaluate potential acquisitions, um, all the way to fractional CMO services that we provide ourselves. So we evaluate agencies or internal teams, and we also can do the work ranging from pay-per-click ads to search to paid social to search engine optimization, you name it. Thank you, Nick. And next up, we have Southfield. Um, our moderator, Tim Lewis, will be giving a bit of a background on Southfield in just a moment. And then we have two poll questions just to give us a sense of who's in our audience. So I'm going to launch the first one. Which of the below best describes you? Are you an independent sponsor, investment banker, capital provider on the debt side? on the equity side, service provider, or other? I'm 
give it a few more seconds. All right, 13% um, independent sponsor, 38% investment bankers, and 38% service providers, and a few others in the room. All right, I'm going to launch the second question. When would you feel comfortable attending an in-person event? Now, not until I get the vaccine, or never. You prefer being in the comfort of your home. All right, a majority of you will be comfortable meeting a person now um, and then split 50-50, not until I receive the vaccine or never. You prefer being at home. All right, thanks everyone. So now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Tim Lewis, Southfield Capital, longtime supporter of Opus Connect. Um, Tim, take it away. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Tim Lewis. I'm a partner at Southfield. We're an investment firm based in Greenwich, Connecticut. We have two strategies. We have a private equity strategy where I spend most of my time and we have a mezzanine strategy. Both strategies are lower middle market focused uh, and by lower middle market uh, on the private equity side, we mean four to 12 million um, you know, roughly. And on the mez side, they sort of view it in the similar parameters, maybe a little smaller. Um, on the private equity side, we're focused on entrepreneur built business services companies, um, you know, really focusing with those teams on uh, professionalizing their organizations, institutionalizing them, uh, and driving growth, uh, both organically and through acquisition. Um, our MES firm uh, partners with entrepreneurs as well, but as you can imagine, they also uh, partner with uh, uh, independent sponsors and private equity firms. So, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you uh, if you have opportunities and, and looking forward to participating in this panel discussion and, and thank you in advance to the panelists for participating. So Patrick, you wanna kick it off and introduce yourself? Sure thing, Tim. Thank you, uh, Pat Donigan. Sorry, the slow on the on the mute button. Uh, Pat Donigan, I'm a managing director at Performance Improvement Partners. Uh, we're a technology consulting firm that works exclusively with uh, private equity and uh, with a um, concentration in middle market, low over middle market firms. Um, been working with private equity firms for about 12 years, um, and I've been an executive that's uh, really uh, focused on growth in businesses, um, previously ran a middle market um, business uh, unit for uh, Gerson Lehrman Group, uh, about a $200 million business, uh, and also scaled a small business from around 9 million uh, to over 50 million. So uh, bring a lot of background on understanding customer um, growth strategies, and then you know improving value through um, better operations. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Sharon? I'm going to take off the, the mute in order to speak. Hi, everybody. My name is Sharon Heaton. I am the CEO of SB Liftoff. SB Liftoff is a lower mid-market in, um, investment bank, M&A advisor. We work on both the sell and the buy side. Um, our specialization is really working with founder owners or people who uh, created a company and you know substantially grew it. Uh, we have great deal of respect for the owners who do this and the people who take the chance of buying uh, somebody else's company. So we like working in this market very much and appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thanks, Sharon. Sammy? Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, Marisol. I'm Sammy Bakai, founder of Auto Catalyst. Uh, we're a digital transformation and technology enablement firm based in New York. We're a bit of a hybrid firm. We have a consulting and advisory practice where we work with companies at various stages of growth, from small startups to mid-sized firms, all the way up to large corporates, including private equity backed firms. More recently, we've established an investment platform of our own, and we're exploring opportunities in the lower middle market as an independent sponsor. 
we're using our technology and value creation expertise to identify opportunities where uh, we could be a differentiated investor and partner for firms in that space. So uh, I'm looking forward to today's discussion and uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Thanks everyone. So uh, why don't I provide a little context before we launch into the panel, very little. Um, uh, Southfield is uh, private equity, very traditional, lower middle market orientation. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, typically uh, engaging the companies on technology uh, from the very get go. But, you know, historically, it's been uh, ERP system, potentially, you know, transitioning from QuickBooks to an ERP system, something more robust, uh, maybe introducing a CRM system to facilitate our organic growth strategies uh, and, and uh, maybe a business intelligence system to, to better pull data from various sources and provide good performance metrics. And quite honestly, if we were reasonably um, successful on those uh, kinds of initiatives, we felt like we had accomplished something. And uh, that was the lens that we typically uh, focused on our portfolio companies. But I've noticed over the last couple of years that other issues are percolating to the surface, um, or maybe opportunities are percolating to the surface, and uh, and that our companies are starting to engage with with uh, technology uh, differently. Uh, and so I, I've just noticed over the last couple of years, I'm I'm starting to develop think I need to have more operating advisors who really understand technology and how technology can transform businesses. Um, we need to have a, a better sense for what our, our, our technology strategy is, um, how we can um, drive value with technology. And honestly, I'm not that well equipped to do it. I, I, so I've really had to reach out and try to find the right kind of partners and consultants. And so for me, this is a topic that's very much you know, top of mind. And so when Opus reached out and said, hey, Tim, you know, we'd, look, we'd like you to participate on this panel, can you suggest some topics? This was the first one that came to mind. And um, uh, I, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to learning from the panelists as well. And we hope that you, you will uh, walk away from this and you know, understand that you know, technology beyond the sort of basics that we've all probably uh, dealt with with our portfolio companies or with our clients in the past, that technology can be a really important lever for uh, business transformation. And it's frankly not uh, all that scary. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from everyone. And I guess the first question that I'll throw out is, uh, is, is similar to the, the, the context that I tried to provide. Um, I'd ask the panelists, how has your thinking about technology changed in the last three to five years? Because as I explained, I was sort of a dinosaur in this um, category. And I was interested to hear if, if the rest of you have also seen an evolution in your own thinking and then with your, your clients or your portfolio companies. Maybe, um, uh, why don't we start with um, Sharon? Do you wanna give us your perspective on that? Absolutely, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm a bit of a dinosaur as well. And I work with companies in the lower mid market, and I find that there are different tiers of companies. If uh, companies that are on the definite smaller side, you know, under five million dollars in EBITDA, let's say, um, some of them are using technology in a very twenty to two thousand type of way. They're using CRMs, SharePoint, you know, uh, electronic messaging, data rooms, etc. But then there are folks that are really have data at or have technology at the core of their company. Um, I have a company in healthcare, uh, but it's really a technology company and the service they happen to provide is healthcare, but it's all with a technology background that allows them to do it. Um, I think we need to, when we're talking about this, we should be talking about it in terms of, are we talking about the technology that we were talking about 10 years ago, like CRMs and things like that, or are we talking about a digital strategy that's truly transformational? And as a dinosaur myself, I kind of say, know thyself when you're going down this path. Again, I'm an M&A person. So when I'm talking to people who have, um, you know, very pleased with the fact that they're now on SharePoint, talking about a digital transformation, but they want to sell in a year, 
you need to be thinking about whether or not that's the effort that you want to be pulling off. If you're two or three years away from a transfer, then that's a different story. And we could talk about that in more detail as we go on. Sammy, what's your thought on this? Uh, just to echo your point, Sharon, um, you're definitely seeing much more engagement and interest in using technology in the business community, uh, leveraging technology in a more strategic way. Uh, I think the pandemic has definitely accelerated uh, strategic and technical roadmaps for many firms. Uh, right now, you're seeing firms figure out work from home, how much of it is going here to stay, how much is going back to the office. But the conversation has opened people's minds to what other processes or workflows can be rethought or reconfigured. Pat, what are you seeing in, in, with the, with, with, in particular with some of your you know, lower middle market oriented private equity clients in terms of their thinking about technology? We can definitely see a big evolution in um, kind of, it's starting in the diligence process, right? I'd say pre, pre-COVID and you know, looking at um, more specifically kind of 19 before, technology, it was definitely part of the process and evaluating the business, but not necessarily, um, it really, it, it, it depended on how the investment thesis was being shaped, right? Is, is technology more of a utility or an, an enabler or could it be a game changer to support the, you know, the growth of, a, of the business and the value creation process? And, and you know, sometimes I think the technology diligence was viewed as a little bit more check the box. It was a little bit more about people process technology in more of a risk orientation, right? Like just trying to not walk into any landmines. And I would say a, a significant shift, particularly in the second half of last year, now the process has been much more enriched. Like, okay, how do we think about technology investments, particularly um, in the early stage of the, um, of the hold period that could really help enable, you know, an extra half a turn or, you know, a, a expansion of multiple and EBITDA. So it seems to be table stakes were just give me a risk orientation. And now it's like, okay, you're the technology experts. Start talking to us about the opportunities and how we can enhance the customer experience, you know, drive top line sales through sales force effectiveness and enablement and just have better visibility across the business. Cause I think that's what COVID was really, um, I think an aha moment when it um, became a portfolio triage situation. I think the sponsors and the leadership team were very frustrated by a lot of lack of visibility in the business, which was also fueled by maybe some tech debt that the business hadn't addressed over time. So that's how we're seeing kind of the, the, the transition of, of cause how you're thinking about technology in the, in the value creation plan. So um, I definitely put myself in the camp and we use PIP um, uh, in the camp of thinking about technology more as, a, as, as an enabler um, and maybe looking, thinking about risk mitigation during the diligence process. But as I said, starting to pivot and thinking about using technology, you know, putting technology in more of an offensive posture. Um, just you know, interestingly enough, yesterday I was with one of our portfolio companies, an industrial services company, uh, you know, very industrial services company <laughs> and that we've worked with on um, the basics, ERP, business intelligence system, CRM. But yesterday we were talking with them about a uh, mobile web app that will facilitate customers at multiple locations having access to the data that our our company um, generates when they do, um, you know, you know, maintenance visits, service visits, compliance visits, and and thinking about ways of commercializing it, and not only having it as a as a um, uh, an, an enhancement to the customer experience, which we definitely think it will be, but also a revenue generator. Uh, and it was this is definitely not the 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 kinds of discussions I was having with industrial services management teams five or 10 years ago. And I guess, Pat, coming you know, with that as an example, can you describe how you know, lower middle market firm, you know, business services firms, uh, both you know, private equity backed or entrepreneur owned, um, you know, how they should think about sort of starting that you know, process? You know, what, are, you know, what, what are some ways of thinking about the low hanging fruit uh, in in the lower middle market technology journey, as you you know see you know don't maybe bite off more than you can handle. 
Yeah, sure, Tim. Thank you. And um, you know, we're we're really very proud of our ability to work with uh, with Southfield too. So, um, um, and it's this a lot of this is part of a a discovery process. You know, there's a lot of press on you know digital transformation and everything's digital, and I think it could be a bit overwhelming. But when you break break down business transformation, at the end of the day, it's about removing roadblocks in your business and and hopefully adding value, right? And um, three things we think about when it comes to technology is, you know, integration, um, agility, and then monetization, right? At the end of the day for the, you know, kind of a board uh, sponsor perspective. And, and then how do you also think about it from the time of the investment, right? Um, and, and what you're willing to, you know, put into a business. So as you get a better understanding of your business processes, then you could start thinking about, um, some level of technology enablement. And you, I think the key point you raised right there is data. I think the, the better understanding and utilization of data right now is, is being a key piece of, of, of transformation. And, um, you know, we talked about in our preparation, um, kind of the playbook right now is you take a founder led business that probably is very light on tech, right? You know, QuickBooks might be advanced, you know, could be operating on Excel and in Outlook as a, as a CRM. And then you start deploying some enterprise class applications with uh, CRM and, and ERP and your financials. And, um, and hopefully you're getting some level of improvement to order to cash and um, understanding your customer journey. I think the next lever or the next layer of growth that we're seeing customers do is how to it, BI and analytics seems to be a really good play. So better understanding your data and then leveraging that. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples of what that means. Um, we had a, a business that had a recurring revenue model. Um, so um, a, a renewable business model. And, you know, they had CRM with Salesforce and I think they were making huge progress in improving quality of pipeline uh, reporting and forecasting. Um, at the same time, they probably weren't monetizing all the available opportunities there. So in a business process review of the kind of the, the customer journey and that renewable, that renewing process, um, they put a BI analytics layer on top of it that started putting uh, kind of how do you align what the customer is expecting uh, in your your contract, and then what you're willing to deliver, right? What are the economics of that kind of that 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 deal, and then how is that uh, relationship progressing through the year? And what it was, it was a great way to get early warning signs of clients that might be you know overeating on on their service level or undereating because both have dramatic impacts. And now it allowed the sales team to get in front of uh, improved uh, growth opportunities or trying to save relationships. So, you know, you're maintaining wallet retention. So that's just a, a quick example of, of what, you know, what, what some of our clients could do. I think the foundation of all that though, particularly with work from home, as you mentioned, because of COVID, you, you got to make sure that your business is secure. So, you know, cybersecurity is a kind of another low hanging fruit one. Um, make sure you're in, implementing some great best practices from a, from a cyber standpoint. Um, and uh, also using your, your team that's much more well-educated and understanding how to not take the bait from you know, phishing attacks and things like that. So strong foundation uh, in cybersecurity. And then as you think about business process that could be digitized or data enabled that improves decision-making and then you know, attacks things that could have a big lift um, to the business. I mean, Sammy, how do you think of, I mean, how do you think about it with your clients who you know come to you interested in 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 retooling their their the way they think about technology or solving a customer issue? Uh, you know, sure. it, but maybe they they're they're new to the concept and you, you certainly don't want to overwhelm them or have the business un, um, stumble, underperform. You know, how do, how do you think about the right way for firms to to begin thinking about technology differently and implementing programs? Sure. Uh, we mentioned uh, industrial services a little earlier, so I can there's some, I can mention an example where we've implemented some work for a client that is a little bit on the sophisticated side. Uh, they had distributed assets across the U.S., and we work with them to develop sensor technologies where we could predict 
the service and maintenance uh, component of those distributed assets. And so that had ramifications for fleet optimization, scheduling optimization. So that's a quick example that's kind of on the higher end of the spectrum of what kind of digital transformations can uh, you can implement. But to step back on the idea of if you're new to this, where do you start? Uh, I would echo Pat's point. I think um, it's counterintuitive, but when you think about digital strategy, you probably don't want to lead with technology. The wrong approach is to say, where can I apply artificial intelligence or machine learning to my business? Uh, you start with the business outcomes and the goals and you work backwards from there. So enumerating problems, frictions, pain points, and uh, where things can be improved. And sometimes those points can be enumerated as how do you reach your customers? How do you prevent churn? Is uh, customer renewal something you're looking at with data? Uh, what is your pricing strategy? Or is your cross-selling really optimized? Uh, so within each business unit, asking how technology can improve the business outcomes is a good place to start. On the low-hanging fruit part, um, we use a simple rubric, rubric with clients. Uh, we enumerate the opportunities where we can add value, and then we rank on four axes. Uh, we use time, complexity, ROI, and strategic importance. I think if you're starting out, uh, you want to focus on small projects where there's clear objectives for success or failure, uh, minimal technical complexity, and a high degree of fast or reliable feedback, and then some sort of strategic value. Uh, I, we think about it as hitting singles and doubles. Um, you, you're not trying to hit home runs out the gate. And so the benefit of that is as you rack up smaller wins, you, break, you build capacities and uh, to be able to do larger projects. Tim, can I ask a question of Sammy and Patrick, which is, you know, let's say that I'm talking to a company uh, that is uh, owned by people in their 50s. Uh, they're going to be holding it for, let's say, another five years. They've got some commitment. They're not particularly technology savvy, but, you know, they're interested in doing something. What kind of support would they need to have inside the company? You know, you can't simply outsource this and say, well, you guys go make, fix this for me and make it better. Uh, I've seen that too many times and they end up with a big book on their desk and they have no idea what to do with. What kind of people do they need inside the company for this to work? I could take a shot at it. Um, I, I think it's a combination of some, some accountability. Uh, what we do is often put a, uh, suggest putting kind of a transformation management office in. Um, so there's a business transformation that doesn't have to be daunting, right? That could be, you know, pretty complex middle market company that has multiple lines of business and all sorts of old technology and it becomes daunting, but you have to have someone that has um, the business kind of priorities at heart and is also accountable for that. And then I think is a combination of getting the right partners, Sharon, you know, you're right. You just completely outsourcing doesn't work, but I think when you have um, someone that's working with the leadership team and has that accountability, because I, I love what Sammy, um, you know, said that that rationalization time factor because of hold period matters, right? Complexity is, are we biting off too much, you know, and that we'll never see the return. And then how does this ultimately add value to the business, right? Because in the private equity context, there's going to be another, another buyer, you know, in, in, in the next few years. So what is that level of, of impact that you could show? Um, and, and, and also the trajectory of future growth. So I think it's a combination of at least a leader, it doesn't even have to be a technology leader, it's probably more of a business leader that, that leads it on the inside and then kind of thoughtful, smart partnership at the right level, um, you know, with some exter external firms. And look, we're, we're, we, we play that role in a lot of ways. And it, sometimes it's just management and oversight. And then other times it's actually, you know, in the garden, you know, getting dirty and, and turning things up. Just to add to that point, um, on the consulting side for our firm, we've been a little fortunate uh, where we've been approached with, by management who have already made those decisions to uh, become more digitized. Uh, but Sharon, the profile you're describing of the business, business owner, we're seeing a lot in the lower middle market from our investment platform point of view. And so those are very interesting opportunities where we're trying to be a value added investor and bringing something to the table that um, other financial buyers may not be able to bring. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, 
people who are kind of older, willing to kind of transition out, but they are looking for an investor that can bring something new to the table. And so we're, we're looking at that as an interesting way to engage uh, with that part of the market. It's, and Sammy, building on that, when, you, when you're looking at, a, at a, a, a potential client or as you start to look at opportunities as an investment firm, you know, what kind of organizational structure, what kind of culture, um, you know, team composition are you looking for that would indicate to you, hey, this is an environment where um, this, you know, we can tackle this without a ton of risk uh, versus environments where you're going to have to take a much more cautious approach uh, in order to ensure success? Sure. Um, I think traditional or non-digital firms tend to struggle here the most. I think usually if you're not a tech-focused company or digitally native, uh, you're familiar with technology. It's part of your business, it's, uh, but it's viewed as a line of business item. It's not a strategic asset or capability. And I think the cultural factors are uh, something we should take into account when thinking about strategic initiatives. And I look at basically three factors. Um, does the executive team or management team have buy-in? on the digital strategies. So do they really believe in these initiatives or is it just a box to check? Uh, second is how is technology viewed at the firm? Uh, is it viewed as a cost center or a profit center? And these two points directly correlate to how much leverage you have in the organization to affect change. The last component I'll say is um, these strategic initiatives, once they're undertaken, how are they assessed? Uh, if the company is too focused on solving short-term problems versus building uh, long-term differentiation, that's a critical piece of the puzzle as well. Uh, it's important when taking on these initiatives to view uh, building technology as a strategic asset, as a iterative process, and it's not a one-time engagement. So those are some of the things I look for, um, both on the consulting and investment side. Uh, it, and I would say it also affects the quality of talent uh, you can attract when working on these projects. So Sharon, when you, you're working with companies that uh, like the one Sammy described with maybe different levels of cultural acceptance or pre preparedness for um, tackling, you know, a technology opportunity. What have you observed? I mean, what, what would you say have been, um, you know, some, maybe some, some warning signals that you've seen with your clients um, as you're perhaps having conversations with them about timing for an exit? Um, I generally will talk to uh, my clients to first find out what their, is their level of technology sophistication. Um, if they are essentially, uh, you know, I'm really good on Word and Excel, um, and we now have this fancy dancy CRM, uh, I believe that what Sammy said is incredibly important. This is not a one and done situation. This is something that you're constantly working on and improving. The technology is changing so quickly. The opportunities are changing fast. So you are actually picking, down, picking a path when you get this process started. Um, if you're thinking about going to market and you don't have a huge amount of technology savvy, then I think you actually might be better off making sure that everything is clean with what you have. And then I have turned around and sold companies with the idea of saying, one of the opportunities for the buyer is to come in and to do a digital transformation. That would be a benefit that would go to the buyer. It would probably improve margins um, but it is something that the platform has been built by the seller. The seller gets the value for what it is they built, but the buyer can come in and do more with it. So in some ways, when somebody says, you know, I'm really not very technologically savvy, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in my company, I will on occasion say, you know, why don't we talk about that, but actually not take the steps. It's a little, it's a little bit like when a company comes to me and they've got great revenue and good margins and all the rest, but they say, I'm not so great at business development. Okay, well, if you got to where you are without being great at business development, that indicates that's an area for improvement by a buyer. I think technology should be looked at the same way. You, it's not like business development, you do it and you're done. Technology is something that once you start, you have got to keep going with it. And you've got to have people inside the organization who take ownership of it. I've seen a lot of companies that said, I'll just hire these people, I'll spend X amount of dollars, and that will improve the value of my company by 10X or whatever I spent. It doesn't work that way. So I think that there really has to be some level of self-awareness for the owners, an awareness of what their timing is, what is their capacity to do this, and then are they really going to put the resources into doing it? 
if you're pretty much thinking about an M&A, that may not be the time to think about doing a significant digital upgrade other than making sure that what you have right now is a good idea. However, I think that it absolutely should be sold to the buyer as an opportunity for improvement so that whatever margin there is could be raised over time. So I, I, really and I, speaking for the private equity sponsor um, that invests in the business where that has perhaps taken your, your sage advice and decided to clean up everything they've got and hold technology as an opportunity set for the sponsor. Um, we, you know, we, you know, we then inherit this business that doesn't have a culture of, of uh, thinking about technology as a source of, you know, business transformation, um, really more, you know, maybe even a necessary evil to, to, to get, you know, uh, orders, uh, get orders out the door, bill customers. Um, what we're thinking about and wrestling with is how do we start to introduce this in an organizational manner? You know, does it mean that we elevate the, if the firm has a, someone in technology or, uh, you know, IT, a VP of IT, a manager in that function, do we try to elevate them uh, in the organization, give them more um, access to uh, Southfield and to the executive team? Do we try to uh, recruit someone who can, you know, be more, you know, leaning in on those opportunities? And that where we've ended up is, you know, bringing operating, a, you know, thinking about an operating advisor who can come in and sort of, a, you know, work with the management team to start wrestling with the opportunities and, you know, pick a couple, op, you know, opportunities that feel manageable and uh, a focus on those. And that's what we're, for example, what we're doing our industrial services business. We have an, one of our operating advisors who's working with us and he's very familiar with the business, oper, you know, working with us to try to um, wrestle this one opportunity to the ground. I mean, you know, Pat, what, what, you know, what are you seeing with some of the private equity firms that, you know, now have invested in this business? They, um, maybe they're, uh, you know, thinking about technology in a more offensive manner versus, you know, just pure defense. Uh, what are you seeing them do to, to really get the ball moving? Uh, it, it's a great, uh, great question. And uh, following on just one point that that Sharon made also, the timing of it too, like, don't, don't fake it, like, and like, just scratch the surface right before you're trying to sell it. Because that's, uh, you know, that could be a disaster. Because now, for Tim, your perspective, now you inherit this, now you've got to unwind, maybe what was a, you know, not a well thought out strategy. And then you're now you're eating into investment that you may want to make in, in other areas. So um, I, I think the um, where we're seeing now, especially with the emergence of a lot of you know firms, you know, maybe middle market and above, but we're seeing some in, in even lower middle market that had been a, a you know part time technology advisor that you know now spending you know a lot more time with with the firm because they understand the um, the value that that can be created. So again, just going back to a couple of the comments that I made, a lot of this is is breaking down business process and inefficiencies and how to maximize productivity. So it's not like, hey, we're just going to roll in and start throwing technology at the problem to what Sammy said before too. Like, let's understand the problem. Is it, hey, we're not good at business development. You know, we're terrible at procurement. Um, we have no visibility into, um, you know, product product uh, profitability um, across product line or by region because our finance um, systems don't talk to our CRM. Like what is it that ultimately is the biggest pain in the business as well as maybe the, the vision of what the opportunity is. And then you start trying to rationalize what those investments make. Um, it typically starts with making sure that the integration of the technology is, is, is there. Because you can roll out, you know, different applications or, or or different technologies and think you're streamlining, but you know, if you went from QuickBooks to you know a better financial application, but that's not speaking to other piece, you know, other other technology, then have you really made any progress? Um, so I think that's it's about expectation setting and ensuring that I think integration of the technology is as big of an issue. Um, because what does that do? That informs the decision making because you have better transparency and understanding of where the business is. Again, whether you're looking at it from a pure finance, from a customer standpoint, from a you know supply chain management standpoint, et cetera. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, going back to that same company as, as an example, uh, we use, you know, the, the service techs use tablets in the field, mm. which sounds great and um, impressed me when I heard about it for the first time. But unfortunately, they don't communicate all that well with our ERP system. So a lot of the functionality, a lot of the benefit that you would get out of someone being able to see an opportunity in the field and immediately convert it into a uh, revenue generating, um, uh, something that generates revenue has is hobbled, um, bottlenecked because some other piece of the technology platform is not at the same level. Um, and so you, you have to get back to, you have to go back to basics. You know, you've got something that looks sort of shiny and exciting and sexy, but actually you, you got to go back into the, into the, you know, the ugly underbelly to sort of set it up for success. That's a, an interesting point. And um, we live it all the time with our companies. Yeah. The best scenario I've ever seen, and it's just anecdotal, so I'm not saying this is how it should be done across the board, but it was a buyer who came in and um, spent about a month or two kind of figuring out who the people were in the company and found somebody who was a project manager, not really high up in the company, but somebody who was well-respected, had been there for a long time, knew the culture, knew the people, people respected this person, et cetera. Um, and they got that person to buy into the technology. This was not a technology person, but the idea of saying this was somebody who was going to be an internal advocate. Then they brought in an outside technology person um, and those two people, the insider and the technology person, who I think that they actually did hire, but it could have been an out, it could have been a consultant. Those two people then let it. One person alone couldn't have done it. The inside person couldn't have done it without the expertise of the technology person. The technology person couldn't have done it without the expertise of the culture of the company, as well as to understand that just because you say this is the way it should be done, doesn't mean that that's the way people are going to do it. So you really need to be thinking about the culture of the firm in which you're working uh, and what level of support. Another thing that I found that I have never seen work is simply giving this kind of digital transformation responsibility to somebody who already has other responsibilities. Mm. Because then it's, oh, you mean I'm going to do my job and then I'm going to do this other thing as well? And uh, I, I have yet to see that one work out extremely well. Patrick and Sammy, I'd like to have your input. Maybe you know, you've seen that work. But I, I've always seen it as you need to have somebody who's really focused on this and some of their other responsibilities uh, are, are go away as opposed to all the things you were doing, do this as well. One thing I could add, um, just to echo your point, Sharon, is um, yeah, does this person, is this person elevated to have PL responsibility? Because that's the level of the initiative uh, that's getting undertaken. I want to to mention, as we're talking about business and business services becoming more tech oriented or tech enabled, uh, there's another side of that coin, which is how do you find technologists who are more business oriented? And so that's a, a challenge uh, I think firms have when they're finding technology talent. Um, you know, I, I write software myself. And so working with systems, building models, uh, these are tools at my disposal that it's fun to do, but at the end of the day, it needs to be grounded in pragmatic and tangible business value. So I think that's something to consider when building capabilities either in-house or deciding to get help um, with an outside firm. Uh, you're not trying to build technology for technology's sake. You're, you want to have technologists on board that understand uh, the drivers of the business, uh, what's critical uh, and what's not. So be more concrete about that, Sammy. Let's say that you are do dealing with a traditional industrial services business. Um, they're not incredibly sophisticated they may not even know what's possible. So are, are you looking to have a business owner come to you and say, here's my business and here are the improvements I'd like to make on it? Or are you coming in and saying, you know, tell me about your business, let me tell you about the various areas where there might be opportunities for improvement? Absolutely. Uh, the first does happen, uh, but really it's the consultative process in the second that you mentioned. And so an example like that is, um, talk about the business. Um, the real benefit is when you're with a deep domain expert. So if that, bus if that business owner has run that business for uh, 40 years plus, there's a lot of expertise there uh, that needs to be unpacked. And so describing the component cost factors of the business, what are the pain points? What are the frictions? Do we're eliciting business problems. And then having an expert, a digital expert, um, enumerate 
the magic happens when you de decompose the business problems into technical problems, or here are some technology solutions that might help uh, your business problems that you've enumerated. So that kind of consult uh, consultative process. Uh, that's one part, we call it like business understanding, understanding the business. The other part is data understanding. Uh, once we know what your business does and what the needs are, we look into your data and what does the data say about your business? And so there is this uh, iterative process of learning more about the business, getting your hands on the data and then going back to the stakeholder and communicating, here's what the data really says about your business. And that just kind of, um, it's incremental iterative process there. And that gets going projects, uh, which go into that um, kind of framework of what's the ROI, what's the complexity, what's the strategic value. I think here on, on the Southfield side, we've also, you know, we're, we're wrestling with that, that concept, as I said, you know, one of the ways that we're thinking about it is bringing in an operating advisor on a very, on a pretty narrow, um, obvious opportunity set where they can basically get acclimated, um, get to know the team, start to understand the business with the, in, you know, the expectation that once they're in there and starting to wrestle with, you know, some you know, maybe fairly narrow opportunity set, they're going to also be, have, uh, you know, be able to expand their, you know, the, their view and look at the business maybe in more, in a you know, more, um, in more, more total, the totality of the business and identify opportunities to start to have dialogue with the management team about how technology could help with the customer experience, how technology could help with um, you know, you know, with um, you know, the the employee experience, with um, operational effectiveness, and and consequently profitability. So, that's how we're thinking about. It. I don't know, Pat. What are you What are you seeing? Are you guys getting asked to to come in and um, and and start to you know, you know, you know, look at very specific pieces of the business with companies on a you know, from a technology standpoint? Or are they bringing you in first on a on a broader uh, basis to maybe do you look at a, the whole business and come up with a list of technology opportunities. I would say for us, because we don't know the business like the leadership team does or, you know, the sponsors. So we're not coming in as a, as a, as a business strategist. We're usually coming in as the folks that know the business the best, particularly if the founder is still part of the team, they usually know what, um, how to grow the business, but maybe felt constrained because they didn't have the equity to, you know, to, to invest in the business or, you know, maybe they were blindsided by, a, you know, by a bigger company. So we tend to come in when there's more of a clear understanding of what are the things that are going to have the, you know, the biggest impact. Um, and I, I, and also just trying to, again, demystify, you know, the digital and the transformation. It's usually about just, again, streamlining business process, improving, improving visibility, um, you mentioned the employee experience. I think business process improve, improvement that can make employees more productive and, you know, I think more gratified in their job, particularly in a remote environment, that really helps, you know, strength, strengthen the culture. So we usually come in again with a, with a set of, uh, of known problems to solve. Um, and I think the value that we could bring in is because of our experience that we can connect the dot, uh, connect, connect the dots on other things, say, okay, well, here's where we're starting, but if we went into a, you know, um, maybe a little bit further, you'd have a bigger dramatic impact. So I think that fresh perspective and insights just from the body of work that we have also brings a lot of perspective to the management team. Thank you. And uh, I just want to encourage the audience, if anyone wants to ask a question, I am looking at the Q&A. So if, if, if there are questions, please. Um, lob them out there and we'll try to cover them bef before we wrap it up. Um, Jim, shortly. I have a question for you, if you don't mind, if that's okay. okay. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> okay. Bring it on. <laughs> when we were um, talking just a few moments ago, uh, you're coming in as a buyer. When you look at a company that basically has the most basic level of technology, you know, they've got a, you know, they've got financials, they've got a CRM, but they haven't really done anything to make it a tech enabled business. Do you view that as an opportunity or do you view that as, oh, that's going to be a tough company for me to bring technology into because there's no culture there um, that is supportive of that. So that's a risk that I, as a possible buyer, am taking in this acquisition. So again, I would I would tell you that you know three, four, five years ago, 
we looked at, I looked at technology, and I think I can say this for the firm, um, as more of a foundational enabler um, of the business. So we would, we would, we would, you know, try to understand how much work are we going to have to do on the uh, underlying systems in order to support our other growth, other growth opportunities. That is shifting slowly, but it is shifting. And now when we are working with our existing portfolio companies and when we're looking at new portfolio companies, we're starting to, we're, we're starting to um, apply the technology lens as well and think about how technology could um, actually create value during our hold period. So in the same way that we might have thought in the past about putting in a, a, a formal sales organization process, um, uh, and CRM to drive organic growth, we'll be thinking, we will also think about uh, how technology could be applied to different pieces of the business. So yes, we are starting to think about it as an opportunity set in the lower middle market, but that's, fair, yeah, that's fairly new. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time. So I, I mean, <laughs> I, it, 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 it's, it's definitely been, you know, it's got to shake the cobwebs a little bit to, you know, to sort of you know, get at it. Um, hey, one of the, the items that came up when we were talking as a group in preparation for this panel discussion that, that um, I think we all thought was important to cover was, um, you know, the, the, the fact that technology can be a, you know, a, a double-edged sword. There are risks inherent. Uh, cybersecurity is obviously on everyone's mind. Um, and I'd be interested uh, to hear from the panel, maybe start with you, Pat, about how you, how you think about Sort of taking this, you know, you know, taking this journey without um, opening yourself up to enormous, or uh, maybe enormous is the wrong word, but to additional risks associated with, you know, cybersecurity and other kinds of challenges. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, I, I, again, the, a main theme in a lot of my responses is like, kind of, where are you in your in your holds, and how does that impact your posture on invest future investments in the business, right? Because some of them can be risky. Um, it may sound like a great idea, but all of a sudden it starts opening you up to um, more cybersecurity vulnerability, or from a talent standpoint, a lot more education and talent uh, and investment in the in your in your team. Not that you don't want to invest in the team, but you know, is it disproportionate just because you're trying to, you know, take this one thing you invested in? Now there's a little bit of a snowball effect. So I think the thing that we try to guide our clients on is again. Um, you know, is the ROI there? Um, is it a defensive move though, potentially as well? Like you may not want to do it, but if all of your competitors are playing offense, then, and you're kind of not investing, then all of a sudden you're in a defensive posture, whether you wanted to or not. So I think that's also never underestimate the ability for competitors to start to innovate and leverage technology and how that might start disrupting, you know, your businesses. Um, and I, uh, the, the, the security and the, main, the, the ongoing maintenance costs are a big factor. Um, and it'd be, it's cool if you have an iPad and some mobile apps and now you're you know, interacting with our client, your clients more, but if that's just like a, a slick front end that's not integrated on the back end, and now that customer experience is actually driving up your costs, then you know that's something we would you know highly advise you not to be able to do. So kind of get the blocking and tackling things right, and then if there's some incremental upside by spending a little bit of money that's not putting you upside down, you know then then it's then it's worth it. But you know we're always looking at kind of talent, culture, safety, cyber, and then R ROI and continued cost because that's a story you're going to have to tell to your to the next sell, to the next buyer as well on how that gets factored into their, into their model of business. Sammy, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, just to add to that, um, as you build out more strategic capability, it's definitely um, the case that there are more complexities and risks to offset, uh, not just around cybersecurity, but customer data, privacy, uh, reliance on third-party technology, service providers, uh, backing up critical databases. But the approach we take is, um, as we've mentioned earlier, uh, when we talk about low hanging fruit, uh, if you baby step your tech adoption, uh, if you focus on the small, quick, high ROI initiatives, uh, you're gaining capacity and technical skills. The firm is beefing up on being able to take more complex initiatives with higher competency down the road. 
Uh, so I think having a long-term mindset is important, uh, working in incrementally, uh, allowing your organization to build more experience, capabilities, competencies over time. Uh, that helps mitigate, mitigate some of the risk, for sure. Yeah, uh, interestingly, uh, not in, I, I think this panel discussed, you know, when we were preparing and talking about this, the fact that we sort of emphasized the security side when, when I was in that meeting, you know, the other day, talking about a, a mobile app, web app, I, I, I definitely pushed hard on ensuring that we were talking to the right experts to ensure that um, whatever, as we were sort of going in this process and getting smarter about it, that we were looping in um, our MSP and um, ma making sure that we could, we could um, secure the information that would be um, available in these apps. Um, you know, because they're obviously, you know, it's incredibly important to have that information be secure from a customer's perspective and our perspective. Um, I don't, you know, Sharon, do you have any anything to add on that topic, the sort of double-edged sword of, of, of em embarking on technology in initiatives? Uh, it's definitely a double-edged sword, but um, I don't know of a business today that should not be thinking about cybersecurity. The first thing that every business does is get email. And once you have email, <laughs> uh, you've got to be thinking about it. Uh, you're going to be storing your documents, your financials, your QuickBooks, whatever it might be. So as you become deeper into technology, the risks, I think, become higher. But it's not something that you can put off until you're doing some really kind of cool um, gee whiz kind of technology. It's something that you need to be thinking about as you're opening your company. For sure. Um, top of mind. Um, we, we have a question, uh, and I, I think it's a, a good time to start um, answering questions if folks have them. Uh, the question is from a, 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 an audience member who asked if, if, if you've got a technology business, you've, you've just launched a new product or service, um, you know, what is the, or you've got a new technology product, what's the number one thing that you should be thinking about in terms of commercializing it? I don't know who wants to take that one first. Maybe Sammy, you want to you know take a shot at the that one? Sure. Um, without knowing the industry or um, application, uh, one thing I would say is collect as much data as possible, including uh, how your app is being utilized, uh, penetration in the market, any sort of data on usage, on uptime. It's uh, useful for refining the products, uh, where it's being used, where it's not. Uh, and so that, that would be my one thing. Just collect all the data you can from your, your product. And then adding to it as you're taking it to market, you know, is this a brand new, is this a product enhancement? You know, is it a, you know, completely new, you know, set of capabilities? Um, you know, how does it cut be the customer, right? What's the, is there no choice in the market for right now? So your, you know, first mover advantage in solving problems or do you have a better, uh, a better solution that you've that you've created. So being tight on that data, like what is the TAM on that opportunity, and do you have a real great shot and you know channel to 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 address that market? And should that be through digital, you know, e-commerce only, or is there you know some level of distribution that's feed on the street or channel partners? And then um, and then how do you think about what? what what's the value proposition you know if we're gonna you know displace some you know status quo or current solution what's that value add and if you have data to support that and use cases that will strengthen your argument um that'll that'll certainly help you raise awareness so there's probably a front-end marketing and then you know how are you also addressing where the opportunity is for that offering thanks um so, I mean, I, I, we, I don't see any additional Q of a, uh, any additional questions coming in from the audience. I know, Marisol, you want to probably wrap things up, right? Yeah, we have some uh, attendees I need to hop over to the Deal Connect. So, we, yeah, we should wrap it up soon. Great. Well, uh, it, I just want to thank all the panelists for participating. Um, uh, it's been an interesting discussion. As I said, I, I was looking forward to having the discussion for for uh, my own purposes to, to, to learn from you guys. And, um, and I hope the audience also enjoyed, um, you know, learning from you and, uh, and, and they're not going anywhere. So if you have questions for them, I'm sure they'd appreciate, you know, you know hearing from you uh, by email or, or text. 
or the old fashioned phone. Let's, let's yeah. not forget that that, that exists. <laughs> Uh, and thanks, Marisol, for organizing. We, you, you Thank kept you. It all Thank you. Thanks, Tim, Sharon, Patrick, and Sammy for your time today. It was a great discussion. Um, and I just wanted to say, if you're participating in the Deal Connect right after this, you'll need to log in to the other Zoom link that was circulated yesterday. Um, again, thank you to our sponsors, Alliance, Sapient, King Edward I, and, of course, Southfield for sponsoring today's event. Um, we have a members only roundtable coming up next week. So if you're a member, please make sure to sign up for that. And on May 13th, we'll have a fireside chat with coach Dana Cavalia. So look out for that invite. Again, thanks to everyone and hope everyone has a great day. Awesome. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.